The film follows four high-profile ACLU lawyers as they fight uh, lawsuits that, su that successfully block Trump's attacks on abortion, immigration, LGBTQ, and voting rights. Directed by Eli Dupre, Josh Kreigman, and Elise Steinberg, the film is being released by Big Magnolia Pictures and Topic Studios and will be available in the 31st. I should point out that Topic Studios is part of the for-profit arm of First Look Media, which also funds The Intercept. Joining me today to discuss the work of the ACLU are three of the lawyers featured in the film. Bridget Amiri, Deputy Director of the ACLU Reproductive Justice Project, Lee Galernt, Deputy Director of the ACLU Immigrant Rights Project, and Chase Strangio, Deputy Director for Transgender Justice and L and the ACLU with the ACLU LGBT and HIV Project. I know how busy all three of you are, and I thank you so much for joining me today. Before we start, I'd like to, to play the film's trailer to give everyone a taste of what, the, what it's about. And remember, it'll be available everywhere this Friday, July 31st. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, the secretary's decision rested on a single assertion that <laughs> Don't do this tomorrow. Have you argued in front of the Supreme Court before? No. Nearly 2,000 children have been separated from their families. Hey, see how you Good morning. Hundreds of parents have just lost their kids. Free our children now! My job is to make sure the horror of what's going on stays front and center. Do you believe in punishment for abortion? It has to be some form of punishment. You can't be serious. The government can't ban people from accessing abortion. This is the president's declaration of like open season on trans people. Transgenderism is a mental dysfunction. They want to erase trans people from public life. Six states would lose a seat in Congress. It's all based on the census. Kind of difficult to imagine higher stakes. The A stands for American. Americans come first. We don't appreciate your work. You're a filthy organization. Obviously, most of you are pedophiles. We are scrambling. We've been actually working up a challenge. Simra, you're literally pulling my computer off the desk. You're not going to win every fight. Just thinking about my own kids, it's just inconceivable. People say, why don't you go work at a law firm? Why have this level of stress riding on your shoulders? If we lose this case, I don't know what Roe versus Wade means. President Trump wins. What happened, Maya? Three minutes. I can't go on right away. We will go back into court. We will them up. All I've ever known how to do is fight, and so we just keep fighting. That's what we do. We are here right now. If I'm not going to be a civil rights lawyer right now, in this moment, when? So that gives you a, a taste of this movie, which is exciting and wrenching and really worth watching. Um, before we get into our discussion, I was hoping that each of you could briefly introduce yourselves and talk about the focus of your work for the ACLU and uh, perhaps tell us about a single moment during all these fights that, that will really stay with you forever, because it's clear from this film that, that this has been a pretty extraordinary time, not just in the, 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 the country, but in each of your own lives. Uh, let's start with Bridget and then move to Chase and Lee. Um, we're having some audio difficulties, so unfortunately, uh, we're not able I to fixed hear it. you. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I did the classic thing where I had myself muted, so you wouldn't hear my family in the background. Uh, <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> so uh, I, uh, my name is Bridget Amiri, and I work on reproductive rights issues at the ACLU. And the case in the film is about our challenge uh, on behalf of a 17-year-old unaccompanied immigrant minor who came to the United States um, fleeing violence in her home country. And uh, she was staying in a government-funded shelter when she found out that she was pregnant. She requested access to abortion, and the Trump administration said that she was prohibited from leaving the shelter for any abortion-related appointment. Uh, so we rushed into court um, so that she could effectuate the decision that she had made about her pregnancy. And she then, after having the abortion, went on to represent um, a class action of young women um, in the shelter, in the shelters, um, to ensure that this wouldn't happen to anybody else. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge, you know, her courage and bravery um, on not just her own behalf in fighting the Trump administration, but willingness to stand up um, for other people in a similar situation. And a moment that I will never forget is after battling um, in the federal court, both at the district court level and at the appeals court level, we, uh, you know, her request for abortion had been delayed while this legal battle ensued. And um, when she finally made it to the clinic um, with her amazing um, guardian ad litem, Rochelle Garza, um, to obtain the abortion, um, and I got the call that she was at the clinic, I burst into tears um, because I knew at that moment um, that despite all of the, the legal wrangling for weeks, that she was now going to finally be able to get the abortion that she had decided to have. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chase Strangio, and I am Deputy Director for Trans Justice at the ACLU. And my work focuses a lot on our trans rights, our trans, trans justice is issues, but I work within the LGBT and HIV project and work on issues affecting LGBT people and people living with HIV across the country. Uh, in the film, my colleague Josh and I are working on a challenge to uh, the Trump administration's ban on open service by uh, transgender individuals in the military um, and we have a number of clients and one of our clients Brock Stone is featured in the film um, the case you know you know we filed the case in 2017 it's still ongoing now um, unfortunately during the course of the litigation and in the film um, the Supreme Court allowed uh, a modified version of Trump's initial tweet ban to go into effect so currently uh, trans people are not allowed to enlist uh, in the military um, and currently serving individuals who were um, who came out under a previous policy that allowed trans people to openly serve are protected um, as a result of changes that were made during the pendency of the litigation that's featured in the film. Um, I think one of the things for me that's that's so striking about the film and the years that they they followed us is that you know we were we were focusing on on these cases, but so much else was going on uh, in our lives, in the world, uh, on, you know, in our dockets. Um, and and so it's hard to it's hard to pick a, a single moment that that sticks with me. I think watching the film, something that I come away from is sort of the combination of profound grief and profound resiliency that defined uh, the period of time that we were working on this film. And that's you know true with our clients. That's true with us as individuals. And that's true with respect to the movements that we're a part of. Um, and so going into the release of the film on Friday and thinking about what this means as sort of a historical capturing of this incredibly difficult time. Um, there's so much to hold on to um, and build from. And I think rather than a single moment, it's those sort of energetic things that I pull from this time period and that guide my work moving forward. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lee Gallant, uh at the ACLU and in the work in the immigrants' rights area, and, that, and which spills over into national security and criminal justice. I just want to thank Betsy and the Intercept for shining a light on these issues. I worked on two cases in the film. The one case is just briefly shown in the beginning, a challenge to the first Muslim ban that we did with Yale Law School, um, the National Immigration Law Center, and the International Refugee Assistance Project. And the other case I worked on, which is featured more in the film, is the family separation law. So challenging the Trump administration's unprecedented and, and inhumane practice of separating 
parents from their children. And I think for me, the moments that stick out are, are always those moments with the clients who, you know, are really keep you going. And every time you think, well, this is just too much. I need to stop. You look at the clients and their lives are really at stake and, and how courageous they are. And I think one of the moments is captured in the film where the name plaintiff Miss L reunites with her child. And I, I've been doing this work for more than 25 years, and that's probably the most emotional scene that I have witnessed doing this work. Um, they were from a little village in the in the Congo, and they came to the United States fearing death. It took them four months to get here, a harrowing journey. They finally got here, and the little girl was ripped from the mother's arm, and she wasn't even told where the child was sent. By the time they were reunited, they had been separated for five months. And when they came together, um, and it's captured in the film, I think it wasn't just that they hadn't seen each other in five months. I think that they did not actually believe that they would ever see each other again. This is a little seven-year-old girl. I think they had no reason to believe that they would ever see each other again. They were from, you know, again, as I said, a little village in the Congo, had no understanding of what was going on. And them coming together is just one of the rawest moments I've witnessed. And I think the, you know, the other moments are all client related, a little 10 year old boy in Tijuana gathering up all his courage to approach me and thank me for helping their family. Um, you know, I think about my kids and at that age, what it would take to have the courage to come up to a strange person and ask a strange person to say, can you keep fighting for my family? Um, those are definitely the moments that, that stick with me the most. Thank you. Um, and that, you know, it, all of those moments really come through powerfully in the film. Um, in particular, Lee, the one that you just mentioned is one of the most emotionally affecting scenes in any documentary that I've seen. So, um, I hope everybody gets a chance to, to, to see that. Um, the, the film begins with Trump taking the oath of office. And I'm curious uh, what your thoughts were in that moment. What was going on behind the scenes of the ACLU in those first days of the Trump administration? Did you anticipate what was about to happen? And you know, were you, what were you doing to prepare for, um, for the, what could be and what turned out to be an onslaught of attacks on our civil liberties across the board? And that's a question for anyone, um, but why don't we start with Chase? Uh, yeah, no, I I am trying to go back and recall that moment, which feels like in some ways like a hundred years ago. Um, I was, you know, I, I, I've talked about this before, but I was representing Chelsea Manning at the time. And one of the last things that Obama had done in office on January 17th of 2017 was commute Chelsea's sentence. So I was moving from this incredible place of joy and celebration into sort of this preparation for what was going to happen in, you know, the transfer of power uh, in, on three days later on January 20th. And I think as an organization, we were certainly gearing up. But I have to say, you know, I had been coming off of several years of working in the States, um, dealing with attacks on trans people and trans lives. And so I was already coming from this place of deep exhaustion and, um, you know, struggles against the Obama administration and struggles against the, the, the states. And so it was hard to conceptualize the extent to which we were going to have to shift into fighting attacks from the federal government on top of fighting attacks from the state. Um, but I think in those early days um, during the oath of office and then in the week that followed in which the Muslim ban was announced and people started going to airports and, and mobilizing in communities, um, for me, it was really about connecting with people and, and learning um, from people in my life who had survived um, you know, immense amount of state repression, whether in the United States or around the world, and, and just gearing up for the fact that, um, you know, it was going to be a fight, and I didn't know what that would look like, and I knew we were already exhausted, but we had an obligation to show up for our clients and show up for the communities that we work with. And I think that's where my mindset was in 2017, uh, especially coming off of Chelsea's commutation and getting the sense that, you know, we can mobilize to achieve victory in different contexts. That makes Bridget? sense. Um, Bridget? Sure. Uh, so 
it, like Chase, it feels like a million years ago. Um, it, and the movie talks about the cyclical nature of the work that we do at the ACLU. And so when Trump took office, we knew that there would be a number of policies that he would enact um, that prior Republican presidents uh, had enacted um, at, that had been repealed by Obama and, and you know, uh, Clinton in between these different um, Republican presidents. So we, knew, we had that blueprint um, that just comes up over and over again. So we were prepared for that. But it was not um, on my radar screen that the Trump administration would try to literally hold someone hostage um, to prevent them from accessing abortion, which is what they did um, to Jane Doe and others like her. And so that was uh, a little bit of a surprise. And, you know, as you, you'll see in the film, it's a race against the clock at that point, because uh, as the pregnancy um, you know, progresses, um, you, you worry that the right is going to evaporate altogether. And in the meantime, you know, Jane Doe and others like her are in these shelters waiting um, for word from a court in Washington, D.C. to um, learn whether they're going to be able to effectuate their decision um, that is uh, that they have made about their pregnancies. Um, so this this was a, this aspect of the Trump administration was a surprise to me. Yeah, I would echo a lot of. Concept? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Chase and Bridget said. I, you know, I remember um, that right after he was Trump with the election, we had um, sort of an ACLU wide meeting. And I remember our executive director, Anthony Romero saying, you know, for those of you who are feeling like civil liberties are gonna be under attack, what better place to be than here? You know, this should, this needs to energize you and better to be here where you can try and do something about it than just having to sit by and, and watch glumly from your couch. And I think, you know, that was absolutely right. It felt better during the year to be able to fight, to fight back. And, you know, unfortunately, I think the public in a variety of ways has also fought back. But I also remember um, after the first Muslim ban challenge, the filmmaker saying to me, do you think this is as bad as it's gonna get? And I said, absolutely not. It's, I think this is probably just the beginning and that proved right. But I think like Bridget, I'm not sure I fully anticipated how bad it would get, you know, and the family separation practice of ripping little kids away, the kids two years old begging to not be taken away from their parents. I don't think I envisioned that. And that's probably the worst thing I've seen in 30 years doing this work. And I've seen a lot of bad things. So my next question actually um, relates to, to the night in January 2017 when Trump signed the first uh, executive order on immigration, um, which immediately became, became known as the Muslim ban. And activists flocked to airports and courthouses around the country to protest. And Lee, you were right in the center of the action that night. Um, could you describe a little bit of your experience? Yeah, so we had been preparing um, with other groups, again, you know, IRAP and Nelk and Yale, um, to challenge what we anticipated would be a Muslim ban from the Trump administration because he had been talking about that. But we did not anticipate that it would take effect immediately. And so we thought we had some time. And in fact, we actually had a call that night that he signed the, um, the Muslim ban. And I remember the call lasting till about nine o'clock at night. And we all thought, okay, well, we have about a week or two before we're gonna have to actually bring a suit because it's not gonna be implemented right away. And then we start getting calls around 10 o'clock that there are people who were who took off with a visa and actually were worked for our US military from the Middle East while they were en route to the US, the Muslim ban had been signed. And when they landed at JFK, they were told, you can't come in, even though they had been fully vetted for months and months. So the, us and the other three groups stayed up all night and filed a complaint the next morning at six in the morning. And I remember then us saying, well, we got to make sure they don't move the people out of the country over the weekend. We tried to reach someone 
from the Trump administration, but realized we didn't really have anybody to call. So we then had to file emergency papers to keep the, the families inside the United States so the court could look at it over the weekend. The judge, the emergency judge said, get down to the courthouse tonight. This was Saturday night and we're gonna have a hearing at 7.30 at night. Um, and I think because I was so tired and sort of not fully grasped what was going on, working on the, the legal papers, and it was only sort of out of the corner of my eye, seeing that all the network news was showing hundreds and hundreds of people flooding to the airports to help, fully, didn't fully grasp what was going on. I remember heading down to the courthouse to argue. And I remember, you know, just sort of showering and shaving and telling my wife and kids, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. I'll be back in about an hour. And getting there, and it was, there were like 40 people outside the courthouse when we went in at seven o'clock at night. So, oh, this is great that 40 people on a Saturday night are, are coming to show up. We had the hearing, and the courthouse was soundproof. And when we walked out, I had no idea that there were thousands of people outside the courthouse. And I remember calling my wife and saying, I think I'm gonna be home a little late. This is, you know, become a bigger deal than I expect. And she said, yeah, I know we're watching live on MSNBC. And I remember walking out of the courthouse with a, a, a junior lawyer who had just started two months ago with us and saying, you know, this is always how it's gonna be when we walk out of court, there's always gonna be thousands of people cheering. And it was, you know, it was just one of those surreal experiences. Um, you know, when it was us and I happened to argue it, but the other three groups were, you know, equally involved. And it was just one of those amazing moments. And, and I think when I look back, I, I think a lot of people who were concerned with the Muslim ban were thrilled because of that. But I think there was something else going on, even for people who didn't actually focus specifically on the Muslim ban. I think there were people who were just fearing, is there really going to be the rule of law? Are our institutions going to work after the Trump administration? And I think the fact that we were able to go into a court and a federal judge, one federal judge was able to stand up to the president and issue an order blocking the Muslim ban that night gave people hope that our institutions were resilient and we're going to stand up in the court. And I think that's really what was going on. And one of the reasons why it really caught people's attention is, yes, we can fight back. Yes, the courts are still there. Thank you. Um, I think for many of us, another traumatic moment in the early days of the Trump administration was when Justice Kennedy retired from the Supreme Court and Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh. And Bridget, you actually argued the only abortion case Kavanaugh had ever heard before he was nominated to the court. So um, I'd love to hear what you had learned about Kavanaugh from that experience and how you felt when he was nominated. Right, so the only abortion case, as you mentioned, that ju then Judge Kavanaugh had heard in his career was um, the emergency appeal that the Department of Justice took from our temporary restraining order that um, allowed Jane Doe to access abortion. Uh, and so uh, it was an emergency appeal uh, in front of three judges, including Judge Kavanaugh. And at, at the conclusion of the the hearing shortly thereafter, he issued a decision that basically let the government continue to hold Jane Doe uh, and not let her access abortion uh, and uh, you know, basically push her further into her pregnancy and having no kind of end um, to all of this. Um, so we asked the full um, court in DC, the DC Court of Appeals to reverse his decision. Uh, and luckily they did a couple of days later. Uh, and. So, you know, at the time that his confirmation came up, uh, we sounded the alarm bells about this decision that he wrote. It is such a clear violation of Roe versus Wade for the government to say that someone cannot obtain an abortion, let alone physically hold them and prevent them from accessing abortion. And so our concern then was if someone isn't going to abide by Roe versus Wade in such a clear cut case of an abortion ban, uh, then what does that mean for um, someone having fidelity to uh, stare decisis and the rule of law and this precedent um, from 1973 that says abortion is a fundamental right? So that 
that is the that was the concern at the time. And, and you know, unfortunately, as we saw in this recent dissent um, in June Medical versus Russo, that uh, our, our concern has to date uh, been true. Um, he dissented in a, in a recent case um, where the court had uh, uh, struck down uh, an admitting privileges law in Louisiana that is required of abortion providers and only abortion providers that would have decimated access to abortion in Louisiana and was identical to another law that the court had just struck down four years prior. And uh, Kavanaugh did not join the majority, uh, unlike Chief Justice Roberts. So uh, that is one of the one of the concerns about um, Kavanaugh joining the court. Thanks, Bridget. Um, before we continue our discussion today, I'd like to show another clip from the documentary The Fight, this one featuring Chase. You can go over there and then because I'm about to get on my call and part of the key is that you entertain yourself for a very short while. OK. OK. Hey, this is Chase from the ACLU. Hey, Taylor, this is Chase from the ACLU. Is this Lina? Hey, is now still a good time to chat? I was actually just sitting here waiting for the phone to ring. Oh, perfect. We're in the process of trying to, to add people to our lawsuits. If you're open to it, it would be helpful if I could just ask you a bunch of questions. Simra, you're literally pulling my computer off the desk. Sorry. Yes, yes, we are working the weekends. We've been actually working up a challenge to the military policy. We really want to include lots of different people who are harmed. Did you break a hanger? Oops. We are trying to move quickly and get a lot of information to challenge every aspect of this. This is like my best suit. We want to just make sure that nobody is being blocked from enlisting. Oh no! So. Uh. All right, talk to you soon. OK, all right, bye. <laughs> That's such a nice scene. Um, and I think in general, the film does a really lovely job in showing you all as crusading lawyers who are also human beings um, and how the cases that you're fighting really affect you personally. And Chase, I wanted to ask, um, even as anti-trans laws and policies continue to be proposed and implemented, do you see progress in the newfound visibility of trans lives and has that visibility in public discourse helped in the legal cases you've worked on? Uh, well, so, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that was very true for me in deciding to be a part of the film was, you know, considerations about my own visibility and not, you know, being able to facilitate accountable visibility of my clients. Um, because I think it's so often that when you have non-trans people capturing trans lives that you see the bias through the lens. Um, and so it felt very important for me to sort of think about both the substance of the advocacy and the way in which trans lives and bodies are portrayed on film. Um, because that has been, in many ways, some of some of the most insidious methods of perpetuating harm against our communities. And so my involvement in the film, you know, was in part to, to sort of push out stories of transness that I felt good about. Um, that said, I think we are in a complex time of contending with both the promise of visibility and the power of representation, as well as the cost of that visibility and representation. It's really easy to think because you see some trans people on television or because you can name a few trans people when previously you could name none, that we're making the sort of progress that's leading to material changes in people's lives. And that just isn't the case. Um, so I think on the one hand, we have to honor the work of so many people that made it possible to have the visibility that we have today, to have the representation that we have today, that is transformative. It made a difference when we were at the Supreme Court in October of last year to know that the justices were gonna look out on a country and a context in which they could actually tra see trans people living um, and thriving, not just as deviants on television or as victims of murder. Um, so we need that. And at the same time, I think it's easy to get a false sense of security in models of representation and visibility through pop culture. Um, so it's we need both things. We need the visibility to push the discourse. We need 
the visibility to help people survive so that they can organize. And at the same time, we have to be vigilant about how we contend with that visibility to ensure that we're actually really building power for the community and, and power, not just sort of facile notions of power, but power in terms of material possibilities to organize for survival and collective care. Um, so I see, you know, tremendous uh, progress over the last 10 years. I see so much possibility in how people can imagine their lives and their futures. Um, and we just have so much more that we need to be doing. Thank you. Um, so I'd also like to talk to, to all of you for a minute about another th subject that comes up in the film, uh, which relates to the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. So the, the ACLU actually represented the far right organizers of that rally, citing a belief in free speech for everyone. But it, of course, it also included torch wielding protesters chanting things like Jews will not replace us. And it ended with the tragic death of Heather Heyer. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine a more stark and excruciating case when it comes to the conflict or trade-off between civil liberties as, as they've been conventionally defined by free speech supporters like the ACLU and the dangers created by hate movements, uh, which are, you know, unfortunately thriving at this moment in history. And the ACLU in the Trump era really finds itself at the white hot center of this conflict. And the film shows that there are not surprisingly some dissenting views within the ACLU about where it should position itself on, on these issues. So my question is, did Charlottesville cause a rethinking of the organization's mission, a debate about that mission, or how you understand and practice that mission as an ACLU attorney. Who wants to take that first, Bridget? I was going to make Chase answer it first. Okay, <laughs> go for it. I'm happy yeah. to answer it first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, yeah. Well, so I don't. I I don't think it's a rethinking of the mission. You know that when you contend with the law period, you're always going to have tension. You know, you, we are negotiating systems of power that are going to hurt people in different ways and are going to make progress happen in different ways. So it's not, you know, it, it's not about rethinking the mission. I think it's adapting to context. It's being reflective. It's thinking about accountability. Um, and, and so in the film, we see sort of some of the internal struggle at the ACLU around what it means to, uh, you know, contend with free speech in a climate of, you know, disproportionate violence against some communities and when people who are perpetuating harmful rhetoric have alignment with the government in the highest positions of power. Um, and so, you know, I don't think we're rethinking our mission. I think we're evolving as an organization to have thoughtful conversations about what it means to do this work in different moments in time. Um, you know, Skokie, Illinois is really different than Charlottesville, um, both in terms of who was organizing the rally and who was in power in the government and how was the message received. Um, but one thing, I mean, I guess I'll say two things I think are very important. Um, the first is that I have been, you know, a, a vocal critic of some of the ACLU's decisions around representation, um, both in the context of Charlottesville and in the context of representing Milo Yiannopoulos. And I made those statements publicly in my personal capacity, and I was fully supported by the organization that supports the free speech of its employees. Um, and I think part of what we're able to speak to and what I have been empowered to speak to um, is my personal belief that not everyone is equally positioned when it comes to the extent to which they can speak freely um, because of you know, the legacies of white supremacy and patriarchy and anti-immigrant violence in this country. And so you know, one speaker isn't the same as another speaker with respect to how much uh, government repression and how much violence they can expect to come down on them as a result of their speech. We all have different views about how to navigate those principles. We all have different views about how the law works. Um, but I think as an organization, we are having conversations about what it means to show up um, in a moment of, uh, you know, adapting discourse and what it means to show up at, at, in a moment when we have evolving um, and expanding staff. And I, I think that's just what it means to be accountable and responsive in this in this moment. So that's what I see us doing. Um, and I feel I've been, con you know, been able to speak um, my own personal views um, freely without retribution. 
Bridget, did you want to elaborate on where you see uh, this issue and also, you know, just whether you think that um, that anything is lost by a sort of softening of the focus around defending free speech for everyone, no matter how odious? Yeah, I, I, I look, I think these are really hard conversations. And I think that uh, everyone at the ACLU has these conversations with the utmost respect and integrity. Uh, and, and there, I, I don't, I, I don't see really anything other than having this conversation together as an ACLU and figuring out kind of what we're going to do as an organization, even if some people don't just don't agree with that ultimate conclusion. Um, but it, it's been a robust debate and it has been a respectful debate. And, uh, and I think that, I, and I think that that's how we make decisions and that's, how, and, and I think that that's really all we can do in the, in these moments as things are changing. Lee, did you have anything to add? No, I just, I think they've said what I probably would largely have said. Great, okay. Um, I had another question for everyone, um, which is, you know, looking, shifting a bit from looking back at these last few dismal years and looking ahead, um, well, you know, could we talk for a few minutes about what we can and cannot expect from a potential Biden administration if he's elected in November in the specific areas each of you work on? Um, what, you know, what would you like to see Democratic administration do starting in 2021 to undo some of the damage that you have been um, attempting to prevent um, under Trump? Um, and what is your sort of realistic appraisal of the prospects that the Democrats will actually do what we would hope they would do? Lee, do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. One thing that in the immigration area that's different maybe than some other areas is most of what's happened in the last four years has been unilateral action by the Trump administration, which means that a President Biden would have the power to undo just about all of it. And that's including all the restrictions on asylum and, and other um, types of actions. And so I think that's you know important for, pe for people to know is that pre uh, President Biden will have that power how much he'll do and how quickly he'll do it, I think, you know, remains to be, remains to be seen. Um, even with democratic administrations, I don't think that we're ever completely happy with everything that's done in the immigration area. Immigration can be a polarizing issue and different administrations see using capital on it um, differently. So we'll have to see. But the other thing I, I'm hoping that happens is not just that a Biden administration undoes on what the Trump administration has done, but also looks to do affirmative stuff and looks to use Congress to, to pass laws to try and provide some path to legalization for the people who have been living here lawfully, not living here, but not committing crimes and, and contributing to society and that there be some path to legalization and that will take congressional action. You know, how much gets done? We'll have to see. Um, but I think we need to do a lot of work to change the narrative from what's been coming out of this administration, that every asylum seeker is dangerous, is a gang member, because I think that kind of narrative has seeped in to the public conscience, even beyond President Trump's base into even, you know, other groups. And so I think that's a dangerous narrative that we're going to need to, to to help change and, and shape a positive matter about immigrants and all they've contributed over the years, you know, which I think most people know, but it's easy to forget that immigrants are a positive for the United States. Bridget, what do you think? What do you so, expect? I know, I, I know that 
what we would ask. And, and you know, certainly I don't expect um, a Biden administration to hold people uh, hostage to prevent them from accessing abortion like they did, like the Trump administration did with respect to Jane Doe. We're still litigating that case. And uh, so, you know, I would hope for um, a policy resolution um, from a Biden administration for that case and to ensure that anyone who uh, is unaccompanied and comes from another country and is in a government shelter, that they can have access um, to the full range of reproductive health care that they need. Uh, there are a number of executive agency asks that we would have. Um, Trump, the Trump administration has done tremendous damage to the only federal family planning um, program in this country, which is called Title X. Uh, we would ask that the Biden administration fix that. Um, we also are asking uh, candidate Biden to commit to doing everything he can to repeal the Hyde Amendment, which is a, a, a appropriation rider that prohibits people who have Medicaid as their insurance from uh, using that insurance um, to cover abortion. And it has been a detrimental discriminatory policy that uh, we have um, you know, fought against and we have been pressing uh, the candidate Biden to do everything that he can to repeal. Chase? Uh, I'm off mute, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think when it comes to, so for example, there's some really easy, you know, quick things that uh, a Biden administration can do because so much of the damage that the Trump administration has done has been through executive action, um, much like we was mentioning, and certainly with the trans military ban. And that's something that a Biden administration could undo in the first 100 days. Um, uh, and that would certainly be the quickest way to um, to strike down uh, the, the ban, which is currently in effect. Uh, I think the, the other thing that we're seeing from the Trump administration is a, a general refusal to implement the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock, which was the holding from June um, of 2020 that Title VII's prohibition on sex discrimination prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ people, um, which not only should apply to Title VII, but all federal laws that prohibit sex discrimination. Not only are they not implementing that decision through federal agency action, they're actively taking agent, uh, administrative agency action to interpret federal law completely counter to the Supreme Court's decision. And so, you know, pushing you know, a Biden administration to have robust interpretations of federal law, to do what they can to pass the Equality Act, to fill in gaps in federal protections. I mean, I think also for so many LGBTQ people, particularly Black um, LGBT people, Black trans people in particular, there's such a long history of criminalization that we can't understand um, doing this work and under a new administration without, um, you know, working with the administration to end qualified immunity, to defund police, to ensure that um, you know people aren't experiencing employment discrimination based on past involvement in the criminal legal system, same with shelter uh, discrimination. So I think there's just a holistic range of things that can happen through executive action that we would need to see and want to see um, from a new administration. Um, and some of those things could happen very quickly. Yeah, I mean, particularly around the police reform issues um, there. I mean, do you see some real potential for movement on that, given the the mass organizing and um, and protest around racist policing? I mean, I certainly think this is a moment. Uh, I mean, I certainly think this is a moment of incredible mobilization. I think that there, are, you know, is a lot of potential to move uh, policy. I think a lot of that is going to have to happen at the state and local level um, without the, the obstruction from the federal government, certainly. And that's there, you know, hopefully that can change over time. I also, you know, I think we have to be cognizant of how, you know, federal policy adapts in ways that can be really dangerous. I mean, just thinking of one example, you know, like, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which was passed unanimously by Congress under President George W. Bush, had a lot of, you know, was touted as a, as a prison reform measure, but actually underneath was a way to increase, you know, control over people who are incarcerated. And so how are we going to ensure that we're mobilizing in such a way that, you know, we, we continue to invest in community-based leadership rather than just relying on formal policy change. I think both things can and should happen and, and that we have to stay vigilant in that work. 
I want to ask all of you, I mean, partly, you know, a selfish question as an editor and journalist. Um, I want to know what you all think the press has sort of done right and wrong in covering all the issues that you're working on and what um, you think deserves more attention. I mean, some of you have kind of hinted at, at, at what, uh, how, in particular with immigration, you know, how we need to, to, to cover it in a way that to get people to understand all of the positive contributions immigrants might have. So something like that. Um, but I would just be interested in all of your ideas about what, what, I mean, in this, the present news cycle, it's just so bananas, right? It's like every day there's a new outrage that's overtaking everything. So sometimes you kind of lose sight of the the major structural underlying issues that we really need to be focusing on. So I'd really love each of your thoughts about that question. Uh, Lee, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I think that it is a really tough job for the media. You know, I don't, I don't envy having to sort of make decisions every day about what to cover. And I think that's part of the administration's strategy is to do so much all the time that the public and the media almost become desensitized and it's impossible to cover everything. I mean, even, you know, within the ACLU, there's constant, well, what should we press out this week? Because this happened in trans LGBT, this happened in immigrants' rights, this happened in reproductive rights. You know, I think overall the media has done a good job of keeping the issues front and center and pushing back. Um, you know, I don't really know that there's any sort of silver bullet to, to how to handle it. Um, I think there are times when it's taken the media maybe longer to get on a story that, you know, family separation may be an example. We filed the lawsuit in March, but it didn't really hit the public conscious and the media didn't really understand exactly what was going on close to Memorial Day, I think, um, you know, but that's understandable. There's so much going on. Um, so I don't, I don't really know. I, I think um, ultimately for me, the only thing that's going to move the needle are human stories. I think that when I, you know, get on TV or somewhere or in a public forum and start talking about the rule of law and this and that, you know, people's eyes glaze over. But when they heard these little children crying, where's my mommy, where's my mommy, it hits people. People don't turn the dial as quickly when it's a human story. And so to the extent I'd want to see the media, you know, doing more of something or different of something, I think it would be to continue to tell the human dimension of it, because I think that's the only way people are really going to be moved. Because um, I think when things become just sort of abstract policy arguments or accurate statistics, people don't really there's just too much going on for people to, to focus on that, but they can grasp a little child begging for their mother and being pulled out of their mother's arms and screaming, please don't take me away. And so I think that's probably, you know, where I would be on this. Yeah. Just to circle back to the film for a second. I mean, it's one thing the film I think does really well is it both gives a sense of the, the nuances of the law. And in each of these cases, you know, you have these human relationships with your clients and, you know, the, the human consequences of the law are very front and center in the film. And I think that's a very powerful aspect of it. Yeah. And it just, uh, I mean, just to say one thing, picking up on that really quickly, I mean, I think for all of us, you know, and they ACLU you in general, the idea of having cameras around all the time, was a decision for us to make and you know created some hesitancy but i think it i think we ultimately decided to do it for related to the question you're asking sort of how does you break through when there's so much going on and i think we all felt like if we're going to get these issues out there we need to use every possible means of doing it and the film was one way as long as the filmmakers were willing to keep the clients you know stories in there and the issues, the sort of human dimension of the issues, that that was one way to try and break through how, the clutter of how much is going on. And so we'll see, you know, if it keeps the issues alive, the film keeps the issues alive and keeps them front and center. But that would, I think that was our hope going in, that the clients 
stories and the human dimension of what's going on would would be pushed out there in a way that doesn't usually happen. Chase, do you want to offer some thoughts on media coverage of trans and queer issues? Oh, I have so many thoughts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think one of the truly one of the challenges, uh, you know, is as just the reality of a lack of trans people in context of leadership in a lot of places. You know, I think, you know, we need more trans people in newsrooms. We need more trans people on ed boards. We need more trans people who are lawyers. You know, we, we need we need trans people to survive and participate and lead um, so that the conversations about us are not happening um, and being framed by people who have likely never knowingly engaged with a trans person, or at least that's how it reads a lot of the time. Um, so I think one of the struggles, um, certainly in like the, the, the 2015, 2016, 2017 period of time and then before, is that a lot of coverage just did not, you know, include trans voices, for, you know, quotes from trans people. There was a lot of sort of uh, you know, the way in which the both sides narrative gets presented can be really painful when the question that's being attacked, that, you know, being tackled from both sides is sort of should a trans person exist. Um, and that's how it reads a lot of the time. Um, and a lot of uh, the rhetoric of our opponents is sort of adopted as the frame rather than a position. Um, so particularly when it comes to sort of notions of, um, you know, how to talk about bodies or, words like biological sex being deployed in a particular way that have been very strategically developed over time to exclude trans people end up being incorporated wholesale in the conversations about how to talk about trans people generally that are pushed out in the media. And so I think it can be really difficult um, to, to feel like you're moving a conversation or that you can persuade a judge or justices when the coverage of the issues themselves reproduce so many of the negative assumptions about what it means to be trans. Um, and so I think just, you know, for advice, I think, um, you know, really listening and slowing down and asking some questions, A, like, would we cover a non-trans person this way? Um, I think we have largely moved away from, you know, sort of prurient details about trans people's bodies and medical histories, but we haven't enough. Um, and then also just how little dignity trans people are afforded in the media, um, particularly when it comes to uh, just our former names or uh, sort of our life histories. Um, and one example is if you Google me, the related searches for my name are all what, I, you know, my dead name, what I looked like before my transition and, uh, you know, uh, like before and after. Those are the sort of cues for how people conceptualize transness. And so given that we have a collective responsibility to undo that notion that that's what's relevant about a trans person. My old name isn't relevant. What I looked like before isn't relevant, particularly in an article about me as a legal advocate. That makes a lot of sense. Bridget, um, what would you say, you know, journalists should really be focusing on? And I also want to, you know, sneak in there a question about um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, you know, uh, there is a lot of attention to her um, medical situation is that, are you really concerned about that also? Or how can we kind of cover the stakes at the Supreme Court level most effectively? Sure, so uh, you know, I'll start you know, just by building on what Chase said in terms of the, the shame and stigma uh, about abortion that is just in our culture and how that drives uh, anti-abortion agenda and policy. And if we, as a society, start removing those barriers um, that prevent us from talking about abortion as health care and uh, as a decision that allows people to live their lives, then uh, it, it's, it's going to stymie our progress on, on access to abortion work. Uh, so I think the personal stories are incredibly important as well. And, and uh, a shout out to uh, an organization called We Testify that raises uh, the voices of storytellers, people who've had abortions and their stories. And I think you can see that in the Jane Doe case. And, and like Lee, I'll say it took um, some 
number of months before people, or I guess weeks, um, to, to really understand the gravity of what was happening in the Jane Doe case. Um, but once uh, that people did, it really, people really understood that there was an individual who was being prevented from accessing abortion by the Trump administration. And I think that really moved people. Uh, and, that, and that is also true of a number of our cases challenging restrictions on access to abortion at the broader level. So when we challenge a law that could close a clinic to uh, force a clinic to close their door, there will be people like Jane Doe who will be prevented from accessing abortion because of government action. And uh, so, you know, trying to get people to understand that behind all of these lawsuits are individuals who need access to abortion. And that is uh, at the stake and at the heart of all of our work. Um, and so with respect to the court, I'll just say that, you know, I think that, you know, the, all of the conversation about the, the composition of the court um, and it really shows how much work we need to do uh, to guarantee rights that aren't dependent on, on nine individuals, uh, that we really need to redistribute that, that idea of how we're going to enshrine law and, and really make the changes at the state, local, and, and federal level to protect rights. And it shouldn't hint, our rights should not hinge on, 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 on nine people in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's a great segue for my last question. We only have a couple minutes left, so I'll ask you to be brief in responding to it. But, you know, you're you're all lawyers, so obviously you're focused on the power of the law. But, like, are there limits to the capacity of the judicial system to achieve change? change? And is there a relationship, does the ACLU have a relationship to social movements um, that's important? Um, and how do you think about that relationship? If you could just answer that briefly, um, each of you, that would be great. Well, I'll start with a very short answer. Yes, there are limits and any really lasting structural civil rights change, I think needs to come from both the courts and the public engagement and mobilization and more so from public engagement. Um, that's absolutely critical. And I think the ACLU needs to continue to be working with groups who are doing that mobilization. Yeah, I mean, I I totally agree. I think there's an incredible number of limits to what we, we can do in the courts, um, particularly as the courts change and evolve. Um, and, you know, we as lawyers can use the legal system to hold the line to protect people who are organizing to create more space for people to survive. And that ultimately, you know, it's it's through mass mobilization, through power building, through redistribution work that we're going to see lasting and um, material change for so many. I agree 100% with everyone that these are all tools in the toolbox that are are dependent upon each other and and we need all of these tools to effectuate long lasting social change well thank each and all of you um for all the work that, that you do um which is incredibly important and um and uh for you know bringing helping to bring this film to public attention um i and and for just spending this hour sharing your experiences with us I want to thank everybody who watched on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Remember to follow The Intercept, Topic Studios, the ACLU, and Magnolia Pictures on our respective social platforms. And I hope you can watch this really important documentary sometime in the coming days. The Fight becomes available this Friday, July 31st in theaters and on demand.